Hello, beautiful visionaries. This is Lorna Liana, and welcome to the Modern Shaman Mystery School, where we will explore how we can apply ancient shamanic wisdom to our complex modern lives, shapeshift into the highest version of ourselves, and become the visionary leaders that the world so urgently needs during these troubled times. In this week-long deep dive into the world of visionary shamanism, we are going to explore sacred plant medicines, indigenous culture, dream work, expanded states of consciousness, mediumship, and working with spirit guides. So today, I am very excited to bring to you Jan Engels Smith. Jan Engels Smith is a credentialed healer, teacher, author, and the founder of the Light Song School of 21st Century Shamanism and Energy Medicine. Light Song is a school recognized for its integrity and its inclusive and versed curriculum in shamanism. Jan's mission is to provide excellence in energy healing and education and to support personal growth for well-being, adapting ancient healing techniques to contemporary life in the 21st century. Today, Jan and I will talk about the cornerstones of shamanism, which are soul retrieval and depossession, and we'll hear case studies so bizarre that you can't make this stuff up. Thank you <laughs> so much for joining us today, Jan. I cannot he wait to hear about the case studies, and maybe we can just uh, compare and contrast uh, <laughs> what you've seen with the bizarre world of Amazonian shamanism. So... I would love to begin by asking you to share with us your journey on how it is you came to practice shamanism and then to teach it or to, to offer shamanism as a professional to teach it and to actually found a school about this, I would say, still in this day and age considered to be a bit of an esoteric practice in Western industrialized society. So, uh, I'd love to hear your story, Jan. How I came to it was actually quite bizarre in, in many ways. Um, my background, I was a high school biology and chemistry teacher for many years. And then I went into uh, psychology and uh, had I was working in a um, treatment center, actually in the hospital, with uh, people that had been that were multiple personality, and so I was specializing in that type of thing. So my life was very filled with the bizarre at that time. I mean, you can imagine working with that type of clientele. But I was so interested in how to help these people, and um, you know, did a lot of prayer around that. And this one day, I walked out into my living room, and there was an old Native woman standing in my living room. I lived in Dallas, Texas at the time, which um, has its own <laughs> set of, uh, it's kind of like in the Bible Belt, I guess you would say. And so I had no experience whatsoever with Native people, with um, uh, any type of visions or apparitions or anything such as that. And she was standing there, and she said, I've come to ask you to join the sisterhood. And, uh, and I will warn you that if you do this, your life will forever be changed. And I was going to say no. I was, I mean, I'm saying this kind of like in this normal tone, but I was very freaked out with this person standing in my living room. Like, <laughs> what are you doing here? Because she was as real as, she was a physical representation. She was not in my mind. I didn't have my eyes closed. I was physically looking at her. And she didn't look see-through or anything. She looked like a solid physical solid. presence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and so I was going to say, no, you need to, you need to leave. Like, how did you get in here? And there was this crow that was cawing outside my window. And instead of saying, hearing caw, 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 what I was hearing was trust, trust, trust. And so, and I'm making this very condensed in this story, but basically I said yes to it. I said, yes, I will do this. And she pulled out this pipe. At that time, I didn't have any idea what a pipe was, except in movies, you know, the peace pipe. And we smoked this pipe, and she gave me my medicine, 
which was north, which was healing, wisdom, and love. And she said, you need to learn the ways. And then I had this sound behind me, and I turned turned to look at, you know, what it, what I thought somebody had walked into the room, and when I turned back, she was gone. And there I was, left with what had just happened. Um, I tried to tell this to my husband, to my friends, and because of the environment that I was working in, they thought that I had just lost it, you know, that I had just gone off the deep end, that the stress of my job was way too much, seeing things, da-da-da-da-da. I also had infant twins and a two-year-old at the time, and so um, my life was full of lots of stressors. So making that story what it is, I then um, had a dream and was told to move to the Northwest that the vortexes in the United States were changing. I didn't even know what a vortex was, <laughs> you know, like, what's that? And um, so anyway, in this very serendipitous way, we ended up in the Northwest. And at that, as soon as I moved here, um, I was introduced to someone that could tell me, that channeled angels, that told me of my experience and what I was to do. And she actually handed me a book and she said on um, soul retrieval and she said this is your life and when I started reading the book I it was so familiar to me it felt like I had I knew what the next thing was that it was going to say and or like I had had already had these experiences at that same time I was adopted into a, a Lakota family this Lakota elder just kind of took a shining to me. I, I was really helpful to him in that situation, and he took a shining to me and wanted me to be part of his family, which is very a native thing to do of making relations. And so that was all about 25, 30 years ago. And uh, since then, you know, I was trained in the practice of soul retrieval. I went to the foundation of shamanic studies and received my training and started doing them and um, have about 3,500 of them under my belt, which is an enormous amount, and, you know, started learning what the ways are uh, through my work with the spirits. And so I work very intimately with the spirits daily, um, several times a day. Uh, they are my best friends, they are my confidants, they are my teachers. And so most of the things that I have learned uh, and teach now have really come from the spirits. I have a foundation of shamanic training that I learned from my teachers, uh, my physical teachers, which are, were wonderful. You know, I had great experiences. Um, but really, my greatest teachers have been the spirits. And they have taught me through experience mostly through soul retrievals of what I was seeing and then explaining how and why things were happening to people. They always gave me an explanation, mm. which, which was quite profound. So mm -hmm. inner story of what happened. <laughs> yeah, that's so fascinating. Um, wow. Okay. So then at a certain point, you decided to establish a school for shamanism. Why is that? What inspired sure. that calling? Uh -huh. Well, when I was working with people, um, I would always bring back a power animal to them during their soul retrieval experience. So after soul retrievals, the spirits always give some follow through for people to practice. And a lot of part of healing is not just the healing event that happens with the shaman. It's a way of believing and a way of thinking about your life and how you experience life. So people would say, how do you do this? How do you have this connection? How, do, how can I do this too? And so let's say I had, you know, uh, 15, 20 people that I had worked with that month. Uh, doing soul retrievals. So I'd say, okay, come on over to my house and we'd meet in the basement. I'd say, I'll, t I'll teach you how to journey. 
And that's where it started. You know, just the, I only was working with people that I had done healings on. I knew intimately about them, about their level of um, healing, their soul, their power animals. And we just started in my basement. But that grew. I soon outgrew my basement and more and more people wanted to learn. And so now we, um, we have a thriving school. It's very large. And I'd like to talk a little bit also about how I envision shamanism because it might be a little bit different for a lot of people and it does have to do with the school. But my goals and from the very beginning with shamanism were that it was recognized as a viable and an exceptional healing modality in the field of medicine. My background is, again, in this psychology, but I've, I've had this just innate um, determination to help people be well. Like, how can I help people be well? And I realized that um, shamanism needs to be recognized by insurance companies. It needs to be recognized in the uh, art of medicine. And in order to do that, you have to have a very defined, advanced curriculum that is qualified and practiced and upheld. It can't be mix-matched or hodgepodge. You have to really be able to provide training that is top-notch. And practitioners then must meet these standards of performance. Um, and so we have testing standards uh, in place for our practitioners. And there's a code of ethics. You know, in psychology, there's this very strong code of ethics, which keeps the client safe and also the practitioner safe, but mostly the client safety. Um, and for shamanism to be recognized as a healing art, not as a power art. There's a lot of shamanism that is all about just an experience, kind of an other um, mind-enhancing experience. But the part of shamanism that I tap into is the healing end. In fact, the word shaman is a Siberian word that means somebody who sees in the dark with their heart. And so it's, it's about love. It's about healing. It's about uh, being helpful and being of service. And so to bring shamanism into the 21st century, um, creating a methodology that's supportive of the kind of the world that we wish to live in. And so my, for myself, when I'm doing like new earth work with the spirits, I'm seeing unity, collaboration, um, again, unification, support, love. That's the kind of world that we want the new earth to be well, we have to have a healing modality that also fits that. Those are the same qualities then that need to be in our healing. We can't we can't do healing based on um, competition or uh, you know harming someone or having power over somebody. We have to do it in the same type of um, support and we, we want the same cornerstones for it as we do our new earth and also along with that is inner authority like people need to be able to learn how to be able to heal themselves in the new earth you know not always be dependent on a religion or somebody else to be able to do something for them they need to be self-empowered and that will bring strength to a community and that's those are the principles that I founded the school on, that we uphold to those. And so our healing reflects that, and then our students reflect that, and then we are moving out into the world with that type of integrity and offering that then to other people. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much for sharing your bigger vision for the school. I think this type of healing modality, I think it's, it's definitely important um, to have it find its place in uh, the world of um, integrative health, I would say, because there are uh, so many relations, uh, th there's a really powerful connection between trauma, 
um, soul loss and illness. And oh. I feel like allopathic, Western allopathic medicine is really just catching up with discovering the scientific proof that indicates that your emotional state could actually have phys a physical impact on your, on your you know, bodily health. So um, shamanism, I think, um, is the age old spiritual practice that addresses the well-being of one's spirit. Um, within a, a particular uh, a way of a, a particular paradigm of, of reality, of understanding reality and the interconnectedness of our natural world, our humanity, uh, the lives, the web of life and you know, other animals, as well as uh, plants and non-embodied entities. So I would love to um, have you share with us more about this world of soul retrieval and working with entities. So let's begin by soul retrieval, first of all. Can you share with us what soul retrieval is for those of us in the audience that don't, uh, that may not know? And then and I'm also curious to know where the practice comes from because I'm familiar with the practice of soul retrieval as taught by Sandra Ingerman and um, uh, through this, uh, the work of Michael Harner. Um, but did that particular form of soul retrieval come from a, a, a specific culture or tradition? It's interesting. I want to compliment you on how well you explained all soul retrieval and, and its link. You really did a beautiful job with that. So thank you very much because it's a passion of mine and, mm -hmm. and you gave it good credit. <laughs> so let me start off with what it is. Um, you're right. Uh, it's about the spirit. Um, and I'm going to make that even a more general term and call it your energy system. They would, uh, shamans would call it your soul more so than your spirit, but your soul. And if you think of yourself as an energy system, which you are, like if you, I've asked the spirits before, how do you see us? What do we look like to you? And believe me, there is no body there. We are energy systems of light and color and sound. And we're in motion. Okay, we're, um, your energy system is much greater your soul is much greater than what's in your body. It's much more vast than that. But it is what gives you life. It is what gives you animation in physical form. So with that said, let's use an analogy of a jigsaw puzzle. And that when you're born, you are born with all of the pieces of the puzzle in place. Okay. As you go through life, you are going to experience difficulties, some trauma, some humiliation, some lack of approval, various things like that. In those cases, we, we do a thing called disassociate, which is a, is a psychological term. We disassociate. It's like we energetically numb out to be able to withstand the difficulty that we're experiencing. Now, for some people, that might be abuse, being spanked, hit, you know, uh, verbally abused. Other people, you know, you might be humiliated in third grade and just want to crawl in a hole, you know, like, oh my God, I'm embarrassed. All those different things. Well, when you disassociate, when you lose um, this energy, when you when you numb out, there's a part of you that actually goes away. Okay, think of that puzzle piece, and now we've lost a piece, all right? And then you go through something else, and you lose a piece, and you go through something else, and you lose a piece. So what's happened now in your energy system, or in your soul, if you want to call it that, you now have holes, all right? Those holes will fill up with energies that are not yours. They're not your divine essence. They are from your environment or things that you're exposed to, right? Or they could be even from thoughts that you have because thoughts are energy too. Everything is energy. And so it all has, it's all playing with these fields that are not static. They're very flowy, right? So you're losing energy that's your divine essence, your divine energy, and you're putting in things that don't belong there. Um, 
So that's a very basic uh, form in a soul retrieval then a shaman is going to find these pieces that were lost and bring them back because if not if you have energy intrusions in you and uh, energies that don't belong in you you will become ill mm. okay you will become because it's not a match for your system the the key to wholeness the key to wholeness mentally physically emotionally and spiritually is to maintain and stay intact with your energy system and things that are a good match for you, which I call high frequency vibrations, which would be um, positive things. Um, we and you can watch a person. You can watch a person that is filled with positive experiences, or people are saying positive things to them, and they kind of sit up and they open up and they expand. This is your body responding to this going, yeah, that's a fill. That is good. This is good for me. I'm healthy. Versus the person that is being yelled at, humiliated, uh, abused, um, whatever, and they're going concave. It's like the body is saying, oh, I'm trying to protect myself from these energies. Now, if those energies don't come out, if they are wedged in there, if they're stuck in there, they're throwing your system off balance and it will show up as an illness, either a mental instability, uh, an emotional problem, or physical illness. And so every single thing, there's no labels in shamanism that say, oh, you're bipolar, or you're, you have PTSD, or you have cancer. It's all energetics. Mm -hmm. How do we take out what doesn't belong there, which is just a symptom you know, the, the physical expression is just a symptom of what's going on energetically and then put back what does go back there. And that's the process of soul retrieval, of putting back mm -hmm. the divine essence to restabilize and rebalance your system. Got so it. That, yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. I feel like um, there are different cultures that practice this kind of thing. Um, you know, for example, I came across an article where uh, in northern Thailand, a woman had fallen into a river and then she was saved. But um, in the local uh, community, they decided to hold a soul retrieval for her uh, to attract, to call back the part of her soul that was scared away by the incident. And they, yeah. there was this whole shamanic ceremony where they laid out this altar that was full of offerings, including candy and, uh, uh, and moonshine. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, apparently candy and moon, uh, like, uh, your soul likes candy and moonshine, I guess, uh, in uh, Northern sure. Thailand. <laughs> so sure. I, I'm curious yeah. to know the practice that you do, um, is there a particular culture or tradition where that comes from? Well, yes. And it was really interesting. I learned this personally from my um, my ally that I work with, my teacher, my spiritual teacher, who is Isis. She's an Egyptian goddess. And I was asking her one time, I said, Isis, tell me something about you that I don't know. You're like, you know, I haven't read about. And she said, well, you don't, you don't really know about... Um, the story of Osiris. And I said, yes, I do. Everybody, that's the most common story that there is of Osiris. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Isis is an Egyptian goddess. And her brother, Osiris, was killed. Her brother slash husband, she married her brother, uh, was killed and chopped up into many different pieces and thrown to the universe. And uh, Isis went and gathered these pieces and put him back together again and uh, brought him back to life. Okay, so that's basically the story. I was like, I know that story. I've known it for years. Every time I read something, it's always about Isis and Osiris. And she said, but Jan, you're missing the point. That was the first soul retrieval. I brought back the pieces to create new life again. I brought soul retrieval to the planet. This was my creation. And I learned from that the spirits are constantly giving us ceremonies to help us be healthy human beings. Mm -hmm. They're bringing them to us. 
We don't get them. They give them to us. This is what you do. This is how you take care of yourself. So that might have all different kinds of flavors throughout culture. But I believe, as she said to me, I brought it to the planet for human beings to take care of themselves energetically because this is going to happen. We live in a 3D reality. We live in a we live in a place where there is bad things that happen. And when those bad things happen, you have to learn how to maintain your energy so that you don't become victimized to the event. You are you are being able to take care of yourself energetically. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah, thank you for that that explanation and uh, and sharing that story. Now I feel like I uh, the the whole story of Isis and Osiris now has a different significance uh, to me. Yeah. So I'm really glad to uh, reframe that uh, that 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 fable, so to speak. So I'm curious to know whether or not one can do soul retrieval on oneself because I have tried. And I feel like the effects were somewhat short-lived. Yes. I'm going to say that the answer to that question is both yes and no. All right? And here's why. When we think of soul retrieval, we are thinking of major soul pieces that have been lost. And in the Western culture, where people have not been doing these since they were little itty bitties, okay, or having them done for them since they were little children. The essence of your your divine essence has floated very far away, okay? It's in a different dimension. Hmm. But you hmm. have soul loss daily, hmm. okay? It happens all the time. Like if, let's say that you're, you know, have road rage or you have an argument with a loved one or... Um, something doesn't happen with your electronic equipment, you get really upset and it it costs you a lot of time, you will disassociate because of that. You will lose part of yourself. An an adage that I've always liked was, I'm just beside myself. Okay, where did that come from? It's because you've moved off center. You're out of your body to a certain extent. Hmm. In the indigenous culture, soul retrievals were done within three days of a major event. The soul pieces were right there. It was very easy to put them back in, and a person could do it sometimes for themselves, depending on the event. In our cultures, it's been so long since the event happened that think of the the essence as just sort of floating away. It just floats off, okay? It needs to be gathered and formally brought back in. But you could do soul retrievals on yourself every night before you go to bed by just what I call singing yourself or calling yourself back home. You're reviewing your day, what was upsetting to you, where you might have felt kind of slimed or not in your power or, you know, you wish things would have happened differently and just call yourself back in. Come on back in. Come on back in. And it's right there. That energy is right there. And that is good maintenance Mm -hmm. of your energy system. You are maintaining, you are realizing that you're an energy system and everything around you is an energy system. How do I maintain mine? Well, you do it with good practice, daily practice. This is not something that's just an event. This is a lifestyle. It is a way of living a shamanic view or a, an energy view that you are an energy system that needs to be taken care of and you need to be taking care of yourself and so that would be a minor soul retrieval mm-hmm. I have CDs uh, I was working with a doctor that his clientele was uh, people that had been um, uh, spinal injuries so they had become paraplegic or quadriplegic and he was, you know, a student of mine. He had come in for a soul retrieval as well as was getting the training. And he says, Jan, I, everybody there needs a soul retrieval. Look at the trauma that they've gone through. How can, how can we help them? They can't come to you. They can't come to classes. And probably they don't want to learn something like this. How can we do it? 
I said, let me make a guided imagery. And I will do the guided imagery where they just have to listen to it. I'll take all the shamanic words out of it, but I'll embed it with very potent um, shamanic techniques and reasons why we do things. They won't even know it, and they'll just receive back their divine essence. So that, that type of thing can be used. And then when you have a really big problem that you need help with, go to a practitioner. You know, go to a practitioner. Mm-hmm. And then when you learn what that feels like to have wholeness, start practicing things and maintaining your energy. You know, start learning. How do I, how do I be in relationship with my allies that I can do this for myself? And so sometimes I'm doing them for me, like big ones, and other times I'll say, yeah, I need some help. And so... God, uh, I've heard that it's not possible to do soul retrieval on yourself because you're not whole. And so in that case, it's good to find another practitioner to do it on you. What, what are your thoughts about that? I would say, again, it has... I would never say because you're not whole, mm-hmm. because then, you're, you know, no, you, you're a very capable person. You're very, very capable. Now, what we do do is we get in our own way emotionally. We get attached to our stuff. And so sometimes that will filter or cloud um, what the spirits might, might be trying to tell you. Mm-hmm. And you'll, you'll filter it out. I mean, the hardest journeys that you'll ever do for yourself are the ones on on yourself and that's why in the school we're we're journeying for each other we're rarely journeying for ourselves we're journeying for each other because there's there's um an objective quality there that we're not caught in somebody else's stuff and it's also really nice to sit back and just receive you know that there's a there's a beautiful loving experience there uh, I think of soul retrieval as is intimate love making of the soul. You know, it's just like, oh, let me just care for you so much that I'm gonna put these pieces back in you and help you be whole. So mm-hmm. um, there's that type of quality too that you just get to receive on a very beautiful, safe, you know, um, environment. And when I say safe, I'm talking sexually safe. You know, that you are that you are being held uh, in the most compassionate way with no strings attached and you can just completely give over to it and receive. Mm -hmm. I would love your thoughts on the um, other practice that I often see indicated on the list of services offered by shamanic practitioners. so soul retrieval is definitely at the top of the list. And then I see something called extraction, which seems to also be re- uh, uh, referring to depossession. So exactly what, what is that and, and how is it done? Well, extraction is not really depossession. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So Again, if you have these energetic intrusions, let's say you were around somebody that was very angry Mm -hmm. and you feel a heavy sadness inside of you, it's an emotional component. It's a, it's a, it's an emotional component that has an energy, a low frequency energy to it. Mm -hmm. That would be extracted out. Okay. The shaman would have certain techniques. We teach probably a dozen of them. In, in the school of how to remove this energy out of a person. It's an energetic essence. All right. Uh-huh. Could be emotional, could be pain, various things like that. Uh-huh. A depossession is an actual being. It's an entity. It's a possessing spirit uh-huh. that gets caught in your system. And yes, that does happen. And no, it doesn't have to be like Hollywood. Oh my God, you know, exorcist (laughs) either. Uh, It's actually quite normal. And it's the reason it's normal is because we, we don't have good energetic practices in our culture. We're, we're not realizing that we're energetic beings. And when people die, 
their soul is in transition. It is moving out of the body, which is this mass amount of energy. And unless there's been some sort of defined path that it knows that it's going to take, many times it gets confused, especially if the soul is moving uh, from tragedy. If it, all of a sudden it was in its body and boom, accident, out of the body, now what? Okay, it, it's confused. It doesn't know what it needs to do or how to do what it needs to do. And there's several other cases like that. Those souls are what we would call as discarnate wandering beings, and they might be looking for the light and not know how to get there. Okay, so here you come along, this beautiful, shiny, bright light that you're just open and available and beautiful and this and the and the being and you have ample space because you haven't been maintaining your energy system and you have ample space and that discarnate being will say, Oh, there's a place, there's the light, let me go in there. And they just move in and take up residency, trying to then live off of your energy system. And that's when a depossession needs to take place. It's not an extraction. I see. It's not just an energy. It's not an emotional energy. It's a discarnate, disembodied person, soul, full soul that has moved in. I wonder, I wonder Mm -hmm. if that's the reason why many Westerners who go down to Peru um, and uh, uh, do ayahuasca ceremony, many people, more more than you would expect actually, but when I look at some of the conversations that I see happening in the the online groups, it's, it's surprising. You know, so you have people who um, you know grew up in a um, society where it just the, the society completely disavows anything that is you know spiritual that you know that spirits and ghosts and all of uh, you know, th- this paranormal phenomena actually exists, and then the person ends up um, in these ceremonies, and then all of a sudden they're really energetically opened up by the sacred medicines, and then they're perceiving paranormal activities and having paranormal experiences and then one of the common experiences that i see is people that feel like they picked something up in their ayahuasca ceremony and brought it back home so i'd love for you to share with us how do you know if you've got a hitchhiker you don't always you can have them for years uh, because they are so much a part of you, especially if they came in when you're young. Mm -hmm. For myself, because I'm uh, very aware of my energy and what wholeness feels like, I know immediately if I pick something up. Mm -hmm. And um, But what happens with it is that, you know, you can... You can be doing things that you're saying, God, why why am I doing this? What is with this? This isn't really what I believe to be true or how I want to live. How come I can't get better? And so a practitioner is usually going to find the the being, unless it's really pronounced. I mean, again, there's levels of this, just like there's levels of soul loss or there's levels of anything. You can have minor things that you'd never even know you had and live with them all of your life Mm -hmm. and be okay. You know, it's not going to cause you problem. And then you can have things all the way up through demonic possession Mm -hmm. that are evil. I mean, there's that whole range, that whole spectrum there. And that would be where people are doing self harm I'll give you a a neutral experience. I had a client come in and she said, I don't know what's going on with me, but I have a closet full of brand new clothes with the tags on that are not my size. Why do I keep buying three sizes different? I can't wear them. Well, that being that was inside of her had been that size and it just had enough influence on her that she would when she was going shopping she was obsessed with buying these clothes and so that's what brought her in 
you know, to to see me like, what's going on with me? Why am I doing this? Well, she had picked up a possessing spirit and um, it was having that much influence over her. It can feel like it's overshadowing you, um, that you're just, you're not clear with your thoughts. You're, you're picking things that you really don't want to be doing. And so again, that range of how it shows up Mm -hmm. is so vast. But a a seasoned practitioner would be able to um, identify this, and I do it in a ceremony. I, it's always part of my intention, actually, and my intention then is going to expose things when people come in. If there's anything that needs to be depossessed out of them, uh, and depossession is a strong word. We can actually say um, cleared out. Uh, 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 overshadowing, they're overshadowing you, and we're going to clear them. Now, the difference that we do uh, in ours versus what a lot of people have practiced around the world, especially in the in the Christian practices, which a lot of Hollywood pulls from, is that we do things uh, with compassion and love. We mm-hmm. heal. We get the we get the being to the light, which is where they ultimately want to go and need to go, and we don't just cast them out and leave their energy floating back out in this middle world environment again. We, we do a healing on them and then they're all, it, it's, it's a full circle healing for everything and everyone. Mm-hmm. And it's respectful to them. We're respectful to them and compassionate to them and loving to them. They're a person that's lost their body and they're confused. They need help. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, um, I have, uh, you know, uh, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition too, many of, um, you know, within that paradigm, demons and, uh, and hungry ghosts are, are entities that are suffering. And so they are also deserving of compassion as well. So in your practice, I'd love to hear some of the, uh, some of the examples of people that you've worked with and what you've done for them uh, and and how you've seen within your practice if if you've seen some of these spirits or you know what what has the experience been like and uh, yeah I mean I I had heard of a story in uh, Brazil actually with people that I know where an entire village was possessed and they went through this whole process of depossessing all the the young girls they seem to the spirits seem to be attracted to the young girls of you know the age in in, in their pubescent um age range 13 to 15. um and so they had to call in all these shamans from all over the state and most of them couldn't handle it and only the the most powerful uh, capable shaman only one of them was left um, handling uh, the completion of that work. And so the stories that I heard about that uh, incident were, were very strange. And I heard from, you know, probably five different people involved. So in your world, world how does some of the depossession or extraction or soul retrieval uh, work look? And do you actually see the entities that are involved? Yes, I do see them. And, uh, the examples that I actually wanted to share with you are more on the soul retrieval. Uh-huh. Uh, the depossession uh, of entities, I will say that it, it is a loving experience. It is, it is where the whole room changes energetically to where it almost sparkles. It's so beautiful when a soul actually is removed um, and brought into their brilliance. It's like they're brought into their brilliance in the room and then escorted across. Mm. But the spirits have told me along with what you were just referring to with different cultures is part of the problem in the Middle East. Um, I was like, what is the root of this? Like, why, why has there been nonstop fighting for really hundreds of years mm. in these countries? And they were saying... There's the killing, and then repossession is happening almost immediately into the children, and so the children are immediately brought into the um, 
mindset of the problem, even though it's not their issue anymore. I mean, it's, it, you know, things have changed and have gone, but there's, there's this depossession or this, um, repossession happening all the time. And the way to really work with it is not to be sending, uh, necessarily prayers to this area, but to actually do mass psychopump and psychopump means to, uh, take souls across to the other side. It's a Greek word. And a lot of cultures have, you know, um, awareness of this. And so, you know, shamans getting over there and just doing mass cycle pumping, getting those, those spirits out of that, uh, middle world environment Mm -hmm. and getting over to the light, Mm -hmm. um, would be very helpful for those areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, But going back, I want you to realize that, again, in my work and in working with the spirits, I always feel like I'm in a learning lab. They are doing soul retrievals for people, but they are teaching me about life, karma, incarnation, power, depowerment, self-authority, you know, living life well. Every place that I'm doing something, they're explaining how things happened, why they happened, and how to create a better world, okay? So this, one example that I was going to tell you, it, it, it's one of my favorite stories because, again, I came into this very unknowing. I wasn't a candidate searching and looking to become a shaman or, you know, I went to the Methodist church. <laughs> I was in Sunday school and this woman appeared to me. And so I didn't have a big background on anything. But I was early on, in fact, this was one of the earlier soul retrievals that I had that I had done, and a woman brought to me their child that was experiencing night terrors. And night terrors are this horrid experience. I don't know if you've ever come across it personally in your life, but I've had that growing up, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you did. Yes. Okay. Yes. You can't wake the person up. Mm-hmm. They're just growling or moaning, and the more you try to wake them up, the deeper they go into it, and they are completely tranced out and having a horrible experience. In, in they're they're in terror, they're in terror, and you can't get them out. Hmm. So this person brought me their child, who was about probably ten or eleven, and said, you know, we there's nothing that anybody can do for this. Can you help? And I said, well, let's see what the spirits say about it. And again, I had no, uh, I just knew how to do soul retrieval here. I didn't know any of the other extras that I would say I do now. And I got into this journey. And what I saw was that uh, it was very kind of cartoonish and that this, um, little African pygmy sort of thing person came running up to me with a spear and he was screaming at me in this African gibberish. There had been a curse or a spell placed on this individual in another lifetime. And the way that it was showing up in this lifetime was through these night terrors. And they said, you have to unravel the curse. And I said, I don't know how to do that. How am I supposed to do that? You know, and I was dumbfounded, but they said, well, are you willing? And I, of course I'm willing. And they said, okay, just say these things and wave your hands this way and it will work. And I don't even remember what it was. It wasn't important that I remember what it is because it's nothing like I do it today. But I did what I was told and the little African pygmy just became completely deflated. It was like he was a balloon that got you know, a hole punched in him and he just, and the air went out of him and he deflated, he dropped his spear and he turned around and he just walked away. So I went on and finished the soul retrieval with this little boy, brought him back as power, power animal, etc. So I'm telling the mom all about this and him and giving her insights as to, you know, how to work with a power animal. And they leave the house, which is all great. And I said, you know, keep me posted. Let me know if this worked. I'm in my office or in my prayer room, and I'm 
cleaning up my things. I always sage everything down after I've had a person in there. And all of a sudden I hear this bam, boom, racket going on. And I run out of the room and this tribal mask, I have a collection of indigenous art from around the world. And this tribal mask had literally jumped off the wall and fallen onto the floor and slid under the dining room table. And so I walked out and I looked at it and I, and, and, you know, here's this tribal mask with this grass hair all over it. And I look at it and I said, all right, what do you know about this? What do you know about curses and spells? I mean, this is just, I mean, this mask had never fallen off the wall before. And I've had it since I was 22 years old, you know. And uh, so I took it in my office and I did a journey with it. And it explained to me what I think had encountered all about it told me how to work with spells it explained to me how to become invisible because I actually was in sort of a precarious and dangerous situation but now that I know I need to take precautions da, 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 da. so I was in awe with this I was just like wow this is just so amazing so then I walk out and I think I'm just going to watch some TV you know and which is where I'm not a TV watcher to begin with, plus in the afternoon, rarely. But I wanted to watch Oprah. So I turn her on topic, night terrors, and how they don't know anything about night terrors, that doctors are baffled with them. They um, only can give drugs to kind of heavily sedate people and try to have them not, um, you know, be fully conscious, which then, of course, flatlines them in so many other ways in their life. And the whole program was on how terrible these things are and that there's no cure. And I realized right then that that was, again, the spirits teaching me there is reasons for night terrors that don't have anything to do with medical science or, you know, chemistry of the brain. They have to do with something else, look to curses, look to spells, look to declarations, look to things that were put into motion someplace else that are now showing up in here. And so to me, that's this great example of the teaching that I receive. And now I've been able to be very helpful with people with night terrors. And I'm telling you, for a shaman, if they wanted to pick this up as a practice, they could have a full practice because a lot of people experiencing them. And it is a great healing modality. I can't say that it's going to work 100% because I don't know that. But I have seen great success with night tears disappearing. These people have never had them after they've had these things unraveled and the healing's done from those curses. So mm. there you have it. Wow, that is a really crazy story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So we have spoken at length about um, the cornerstones of shamanism, and we are at the end of our session. So I would love for you to, uh, to share with us your thoughts on, you know, of all the things that we discussed, what is the principal takeaway that listeners ought to uh, receive from our conversation today. Thank you. Yes. Cause I know a lot of listeners will be thinking of personal places that they need to receive healing. And it's probably true. They do. But I also believe in the, I guess it's a scripture that says you can teach a person you, or you can give people fish or you can teach them how to fish and how to really know how to, feed themselves. And so what I want them to take away from today is I want to teach you how to take care of yourself. Yes, you probably do need healings in particular parts of your life, but when you learn and really incorporate that you're an energy system and that you're affected with energies around you and you can learn how to take care of yourself and empower yourself and give yourself inner authority where it doesn't matter what's happening around you because you're completely centered inside of yourself and you know how to do these things, that's when you become a truly self-actualized human being of, of again, inner, 
authority and we start creating the new world and the new earth in the way that we truly want to live in, which is unification, support, collaboration, inner authority, and, and uh, doing things from a basis of love. Because it's really love is the key here. It's a high frequency energy that heals and maintains. And when it's done with integrity, which is what real love is, and non-conditions, then you end up with a great product, which is healthy life. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's learning how to do it for yourselves. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. May I ask you about the free gift that you have for our audience, please? Um, the free gift is called Take Your Body With You, and there's a whole story around this, too. Uh, it's, a, it's a drumming CD that actually helps balance your energies to the cosmos. You can read about it on my website. It's a long story, but in, in the short thing, I had to sleep outside for a year with nothing, just to be exposed to um, the light of the stars and da 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 da, all the different things that happens, the elements, which I did. And uh, and then the spirit said, now we're going to bring a rhythm through so that other people can have this alignment take place that they don't have to do this, but it's going to help bring them into alignment. It, the, the gist of it is, is we really got out of alignment when electric lights were created, when electricity was invented and it brought us out of the cycles of the moon and the stars and the sun. Um, our energy systems were completely affected by this and thrown off out of alignment. And we have to, we have to realign with the cosmos really. So mm -hmm. that's your gift. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that gift. We're going to put the link to receive that gift just below this video. And how can the audience best stay in touch with you, Jan? Well, through my website, which is lightsong.net. You can also contact me at info at lightsong.net. And, um, you know, the, the best way, we have classes that are uh, on video and online, so it's not like you have to live in the Portland area, uh, which is where I'm from, uh, to be here. We, we have a very beautiful outreach to the public. And, again, our goal is that, that you're well, and that we have interconnected communities of well-being. That's part of our mission statement. So wonderful. And if somebody was interested in attending your school, then do you offer online education? We do. We do. Great. It's not it's not complete. You can't get your. Yeah, you know, we have. Uh, we're one of the first schools that has full bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs. Um, you can't get those just online, mm -hmm. but as far as learning a lot of shamanic principles and techniques, absolutely, you can do that online. And you're doing it in small groups with a teacher, kind of like we're interacting. It's not um, that you're just listening to a webinar. You're actually interacting with other people and practicing so techniques. So, Wonderful. We'll include the link to the school down below as well. Yeah. I also have a quite, um, quite an array of podcasts if people are just interested in other you know, just hearing opinions on things, you can listen to those, and that's free, you know, like to be of service to people, so. Fantastic, thank you so much for sharing with us your stories, experience, and wisdom. I wanna wish you a beautiful rest of your day, Jan. Thank you. It's, it was a pleasure. You're just a delightful human being. Thank you so much Bye. for this opportunity. Bye. <laughs> so, Bye. <I. laughs>